Hi, I'm Bob. Let's solve the problem set at the end of Chapter Eight, Heteroscedasticity, from the textbook Introductory Econometrics: A Modern Approach, the Seventh Edition, by Professor Jeffrey Woodridge. We will find answers to the first four problems today. The first problem is about the properties of the OLS estimators under heteroscedasticity. My answer to part one is no. OLS estimators are consistent if the first four assumptions are satisfied. The most critical assumption to ensure consistency is the zero correlation assumption. For the second part, my answer is yes. It is the consequence of heteroscedasticity. The usual F statistics, based on the sum of squared residuals, no longer have an F distribution in the presence of heteroscedasticity. Part three is also a consequence of heteroscedasticity. OLS estimators are the best linear unbiased estimator. Blue under the first five assumptions. If the variance of the error term conditional on x is not constant, other estimators could have a smaller variance than the OLS estimators. For example, the weighted least squares estimators are more efficient, that is, have a smaller variance than OLS if we can correctly specify the error term's variance. Let's solve problem two. The variance of the error term can be written as sigma squared times h, where h equals income squared. So the square root of h equals income. We divide the original equation by income to get the transformed equation. We can show that the new error term has a constant variance. From the transformed equation, we find that the intercept is beta one, which is the coefficient on income in the original equation. For problem three, the statement is false. When an important variable has been omitted from the model, both OLS and WLS suffer from omitted variable bias. We cannot tell which one is better. The variables have the expected signs in part one of problem four. The average GPA and the past GPA are measures of the student's academic performance and should positively affect the current term GPA. The total credit hours measure the student's learning experience and also have a positive effect on GPA. Using either the usual standard errors or the heteroscedasticity robust standard errors, the average GPA and the past GPA are statistically significant at the five percent level. The total credit hours variable is not significant at the five percent level. It does not matter which standard errors are used. In part two. The long hypothesis implies that one more point in the average GPA is associated with one more point in the term GPA, holding other variables in the model fixed. If we use the usual standard error, the t statistic equals minus zero point five seven. And its p-value against a two-sided alternative is 0.57. If we use the heteroscedasticity robust standard error to compute the t-statistic, it equals minus 0.6, and its p-value is 0.55. We could not reject the null hypothesis in both cases at the five percent level. For the last part. 
the t statistic using the usual standard error is minus 1.6, and its p-value against a two-sided alternative is 0 0.11. The in-season effect is not statistically significant at even the 10% level. But when we use the heteroscedasticity robust standard error, the t-statistic is minus 1.96, and its p-value is about 0 0.05. It is significant at the 5% level. It matters which standard error we use to compute the t-statistics. Thank you so much for solving the problems with me. See you soon. Thank you for watching this video and subscribing to my YouTube channel. See you next time.